This is going to be a, a hands-on session. Um, and so actually, I brought a bunch of different topics we could talk about today. Um, and I really want to make the session about like, what's most useful for people in the audience. Um, and so I have a bunch of suggestions of stuff we can walk through. Um, if people like, think any of the particular topics are interested in here, or if there's other topics, um, I'm happy to do kind of whatever people want to do. Um, this is a hands-on session, so I'd love to like, you know, get out laptops and, and sit down with some code and, and make some stuff happen. So, um, you know, anyone want to call out something that you want to dig into here? Yes. Tour of the LVM Wasm backend. All right. Let's do it. All right, so the LVM backend is in upstream LVM. Um, can you all read this for me well? Most of the code is in the live slash target slash web LVM directory. And there's quite a bit of code here. Um. <laughs> oh, there we go. OK. So this is uh, a few files. Um, and it's sort of, sort of interesting to look at this, because uh, WebAssembly um, is, is pitched as this language that's supposed to be easy to compile for, or friendly to compilers. Um, turns out there's a lot of stuff we have to do to bridge what LVM thinks is what compilers do and what WebAssembly thinks is what compilers do. So um, this is a lot of stuff. Uh, so let's actually zoom in a little bit so you can read some things we're going to talk about. Um, WebAssembly target machine is kind of one of the top level um, driver programs. Let's see. Target flags. OK. So add IR passes. So this is one of the flags that's actually configuring the pass manager for LVM. So LVM has a pass manager. It runs lots of different passes. Hundreds of passes get run during compilation. Um, and so one of the things you can do in the target directory is you can register additional passes for targets. You can do additional transformations. And so we're going to do some, some transformations here. Um, and each of these passes that we're going to add is basically a, a file. So we add um, coalesce features and strip atomics, um, and then the, the create atomic expand pass. Um, what these are all about is um, WebAssembly doesn't have atomics yet. This is kind of a surprising thing for LVM. LVM assumes that all hardware platforms will have atomics. Um, but we don't have atomics yet in WebAssembly. It's getting them. WebAssembly is getting support for shared memory. So what we have right now is the ability to have passes that will take atomic operations and lower them into non-atomics, um, just so that we can compile code for the single-threaded WebAssembly model right now. Um, and so you can see comments saying, this is a no-op if atomics are not um, used in the module. So we're transforming atomics into non-atomics. Um, uh, the actual code for this pass is particularly interesting. It's like, go through and find the atomics and just make them non-atomic. Um, turn read, modify, write into a literally a load to the operation store. Um, create WebAssembly, add missing prototypes. So in WebAssembly, um, th this talk will also serve as like a low-level tour of WebAssembly and so the ins and outs of the low-level details. So WebAssembly requires that the caller and callee signatures match. If you're passing something with two R32s, on the caller side, the callee has to have two I32s expecting on the input side. You can't have a mismatch. Um, and WebAssembly doesn't have a facility for variable length argument lists. There's, there's a finite number of arguments that has to be dis discreetly named, um, has to be the same on the caller and the callee side. And so we don't have the ability to describe the semantics of a C unprototyped call. C has this kind of concept of you just say foo, open, close paren. Um, and the compiler will just sort of divine what it thinks the signature is for that based on some pretty primitive rules. Um, assume the return value is int, and assume the arguments are passed like var args, sort of what it'll do. Um, except we don't have var args. And, and, and um, we have a thing that we can do to emulate var args, but it's not the same calling convention as the non var args call. Um, in fact, the, the way we do var args in C is we actually have, we have to pass an extra, we allocate the var args memory in a separate buffer and we pass an argument to where the buffer is. Um, and so this is actually different between WebAssembly and all of our other targets. Um, in fact, I just saw a report on, on Gitter today where someone was, was trying to debug something, and they're adding printf statements, and they had forgotten to, to declare printf or, or include the header file for it. Um, and this works on every other platform, because you can just you know, call printf. This is how it worked back in KNR back in the day before they even had header files. You just called printf, and the implicit declaration worked. Um, but now in WebAssembly, 
Uh, it's actually really funny because, the, because you're passing a pointer to the buffer, or at least that's what printf expects. Um, if you try to print the pointer value with a non-declared printf, you'll get a pointer value which contains the string of the thing you're trying to print, uh, which is really weird to debug. So this can do lots of weird, lots of weird problems. Um, and so LVM is trying to compile C, and C has unprototype functions in it. And so we do some really horrible magic here to rewrite functions that don't have prototypes. Add signatures to prototype those functions. So we're going to sort of like do a better job of inferring what we think the prototype should be and fix up the calls. Um, C also has some really ugly semantics where if the caller and callee don't exactly match, um, depending on how you interpret the C standard, um, there are ways we can get away with it if you cast function pointers around. Um, and we have some emulation for this. So if you're casting a function pointer from one, one type to another type, um, we will actually insert extra code to emulate the semantics of what a native platform would do in the case of a function pointer cast. Are you trying to um, implement de facto C as defined by what other platforms actually do? Or are, OK. Yes. Yeah. I don't actually know offhand the, the official C standard rules. I think most of the time it's undefined behavior if you actually do any kind of non trivial function pointer casting. But there is a very, much, very strong de facto understanding of you can do the cast if you are passing fewer arguments, for example. Or passing more arguments, you can, you can cast away arguments. Okay. Uh, or you can cast away a return value. There have been attempts to write down precisely a kind of consensus de facto C. Have you looked at any of those? No. What we're doing is a pretty ad hoc thing, where we okay. just sort of make our best guess of what we think the signature really is, and then try to coerce the call site, whatever we have, into that. OK. And are you specifically at this level, are you concerned specifically with C as opposed to C++? Uh, C++ does not have implicit declaration. They actually just define that to be not a, not a thing in C++, so you can't actually get this in C++. Uh, although you, you can cast function pointers in C++, so I guess you have that problem with it. I, I would uh, imagine that de facto C++ includes all of de facto C. Um, C++ is not a super set of C. De jure? No, is, is de facto. It, um, really? C++ okay. does not include implicit function declaration. That's okay. just not a feature of C++, whereas a feature in C. Um, okay. In fact, C is deprecated, and they're talking about taking it out. They may have done it. I actually haven't followed that closely. Um, but C99, for example, has implicit function declaration. C++ doesn't. Um, so add missing prototypes. We're fixing up unprotected function declarations. Um, and of course, any of this stuff, feel free to ask me. I'm not digging into these force files, because in most cases, it's, it's pretty mechanical. Like, you know, go in and find the problematic thing and do some stuff to course it up. We can talk about it if you're interested in getting a a tour of LVMAR manipulations. We can talk about this stuff. So certainly uh, ask questions. Otherwise, I'll just like, go on to the list, because there's a bunch of stuff here. Um, global, lower global detours. Uh, so in C++, you can have static objects, uh, or objects at, at global scope, where the constructor runs before main. So these objects are sort of like global objects. They get constructed before main calls. Um, and the semantics are that then they get the destructor gets called after main exits. So there's sort of this outer scope that exists outside of main. Um, a lot of object file formats, um, like ELF, have, have kind of this nice parallel structure of there's an init section in, in the object file format for functions that can get registered to call before main. Um, and then the parallel of that is the Finney, Finney section, the things that get run after main. Um, except that in practice, Finney sections are actually not what you want, even though they kind of have this nice parallelism of, you know, it's the, it's the opposite of what the init section does. Um, we have to be really careful with this, because if you have an init section and you're going along and calling things, and one of the constructor throws an exception, we then want to go and run the destructors for the things that have been constructed, but not all the destructors. So if we have a finny section, it just says, you know, run all the destructors, um, and we're halfway through the constructors when we're running the destructors, then we're going to run destructors on things that aren't constructed yet. Uh, so in practice, we don't actually use the finny section. Uh, LVM has this thing called .lvm.globaldetours, which is essentially LVM's abstraction over the, what, what ELF calls the Finney or the finalization section. Other object file formats have their own things, which is basically this concept of functions that will get run after main. So LVM calls it lvm.globaldetours. Um, so what we'll actually do is if a module contains any of this stuff, if, if you're compiling C++ code and you have a global variable that has a destructor, um, we'll rewrite this into lvm.globalctours, a constructor section, that will run a function before main, which we do support, um, and register the destructor with, with a function call called CSA ex at exit. Um, 
If you're familiar with at exit, it's basically a way to, to ask the C runtime to register a function to be called when the program exits. Um, and CXA at exit is a special version of that for the C++ ABI that allows you to pass um, the argument to it in the way that C++ expects. Um, and so we don't actually use the sort of cleanup section. We actually rely on the, the C runtime when you call exit or when, when main exits um, to go through and, and call the cleanup functions. And that way, we can only call the functions that are, that are actually registered. So when constructors run, if the constructor throws, um, no further constructors will get called, and the, the functions that would register the destructors won't get called either. So at the end, we'll only run the destructors for things that get registered. So we're, we're transforming functions that are in, in LVMAR registered as global detours and translating them into wrapper functions in the, in the CTOR section, the constructor section, that call at exit to register the destructor to run after main. And this, is, this achieves essentially the same semantics. Uh, without requiring us to have a finny section that could call after main. Um, so down the list a little bit more, um, fixed function big casts is actually a separate pass. I kind of actually mixed this one in with, with um, the add missing put up section, but it's a similar idea where we're looking at the code and trying to make our best guess of, of what we think the type should be and then coercing the program into using that type um, following the de facto understood C semantics. Um, and it actually turns out that, that Clang itself will actually rely on being able to cast function pointers in some cases in order to make C++ V tables and like some Objective-C situations work. It'll actually do calls in situations where it knows that this is safe on all platforms. You can cast away arguments and, and cast away return values, um, which you can't actually do on WebAssembly because it actually requires that the call and call match exactly. Um, and so we actually have to have this to correctly compile C++ and Reactive-C in some cases. Optimize the return function attributes. So LVMIR has lots of fun attributes you can put on arguments um, to specify different optimizations. One of them is the returned attribute. And what this is saying is you put the attribute on an argument, and it says, this function is going to return the value of this argument. It's for functions like memcopy, where the memcopy is just defined to return the value of its first argument. That's what they use the return value for. Um, it's also used for like C++ constructors, where in the common ABIs, the constructor will take a this parameter as its first argument. And in, in many ABIs, it'll also return, uh, at least the operator new will return the this as a return value. Um, and if you tell the compiler this, the compiler, the register allocator can actually make the assumption that um, this, this value, like ordinarily arguments are, are called clobbered. Um, but if you know that a particular argument is being passed and it'll be returned as the same thing, then the compiler can just assume that, that I'm going to get the value back. I don't have to worry about you know, saving and restoring it. Um, WebAssembly doesn't have this. Um, but WebAssembly does have um, a thing we can do with this information. Oops. Say visit call sites. All right, and I have to admit, um, it's been a little while since I wrote this code, so I have to like refresh my memory of exactly what it's doing here. Um, so. Right, okay, so if you have um, a function and you're passing arguments, you have uses of those arguments after the function. I can actually probably write a better example if I pull my editor here and do this. So if I have like this is something I'm gonna call, and let's say we know that the value of x is returned. and I use A multiple times. Um, what we can do is, instead of having A in a local that we have to copy in here and then preserve and register into the next call, um, if we know that A is returned by foo, uh, it, we can actually rely on the fact that we're gonna have 
instead of holding A in a register across the first call where it has to be saved and restored, we just pass it in and get the return value back and then take the return value and pass it to the next call. So this is an optimization where we can actually rewrite the call using the LVM return attribute to save, save and restoring arguments across calls. Um, and this is kind of a fun thing to do, particularly on WebAssembly, because it, it dovetails with uh, the stack matching code of, you know, we're going to do push and pop. Um, and so in this case, we pass A, do the foo. Foo will push its return value on the stack. Now, ordinarily, I'm, I'm I semicolon, I, I ignore the return value here. There's no use of return value. But the, the stack of our code that does register stack, um, stack fying can say, um, since I know you're using the return value here, um, I can just leave that on the stack and do the next foo. I don't have to, I don't have to re-push it again. So it actually saves some code sides with the WebAssembly stack machine as well. Yes, question. Um, yeah, I have a question. It might be more about uh, Rust than C, though. I'm huh? not sure if it's about Rust or LLVM. Uh, there, so Rust has a type, an I128 type. Mm -hmm. And we've noticed that compiling that to WASM generates some pretty bloated WASM. And uh, we were wondering if maybe using just I64 in, in Rust would uh, be more optimal. But I don't know if you had any. Um, uh, so the code is. handle I128 in LVM is pretty generic. It's not stuff that we wrote. Actually, it's target independent. Um, is that I128, is that a LLVM type or? Yes. So LLVM has an I128 type and it has generic lowering for it. That should do a pretty good job. Um, it's hampered in the case of WebAssembly because WebAssembly doesn't yet have uh, add with carry or multiply with the high results, um, double shift. There's a couple of instructions that you want. Um, and we're sort of waiting on adding these because we're waiting for multi-value to land. When we get multi-value, we'll probably add the, here's an add that gives you the, the regular add result plus an additional value saying here's the carry result. And for multiply, you know, the result of multiply is twice as wide as the inputs. And so WebAssembly only gives you the lower half of that right now. And so we can give you multiply that gives you both halves. If we have that, um, then we could tell LVM's generic lowering code to like, go ahead and, because LVM has the code to use those effectively. Um, and it would do a much better job if we added those instructions. So that's why my first guess is if you're comparing this to like native code, where uh, a, a native compiler would, would make use of these instructions on the hardware on, on most platforms. Well, we don't want comparison is to handwritten WebAssembly. In that case, I don't know what it is. I know that um, we haven't done any special work for I-128 in WebAssembly. That's not a thing we've looked at at all. There is generic code in LLVM. There are some parameters to it, and the parameters are things like, what instructions do I have available? Do I have you know, add with carry and, and multiply low high and that kind of stuff? And so right now, all those parameters are basically like, no, you don't have any of that stuff. So it's doing the conservative algorithm. Um, and it's possible that that algorithm just hasn't been tuned because most platforms don't need that algorithm. Most platforms have a way to do an add with carry, for example. Um, so it's possible the code in LVM to do that is just not very efficient yet. That, that would be my, my suspicion. Um, Thanks. Um, in, in which case, if that's the case, then, then when we add that with carry, um, assuming that we do, which I kind of assume that's just like, like a given that we want that, once we have multi-value, then it'll, it'll fix that, hopefully. Direct cross-compile, I'm sure, I don't think I've tried. I don't know what that feature is. Um, I'm just going from Rust to Wasm, the standard way, so I don't know. Uh, what. So the, the, if you have Rust code, the only way to get to Wasm is to go through the LVM backend right now. Um, so Inscripten is also using the, the same backends. Um, so actually, the, the Inscripten has two backends. Um, one of them is the, the fast comp backend, where it's actually emitting JavaScript and then using transformation magic to turn it into WebAssembly. Um, and I, its I128 code might be handwritten, because it might be calling out the JavaScript to do the I128, I think. Uh, so, so you would not recommend using I128? You're not sure if it would make a difference? Well, at the, if you used I64 as a replacement for I128, like if you're going to do your own I128, build it out of I64s, my uh -huh. guess is that there's nothing you could do that LVM couldn't do. Um, unless LVM is just doing a really horrible job, which is also possible. Uh, I would have to look at the code sequence to know. Um, if you have code sequences, I'd be interested in taking a look at what, what's going on there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so this is the fun um, optimized return thing. Um, and this is, this is particularly important for, for C++ constructors. We have a constructor call that, that gets passed in this argument, and it returns with this argument. And so constructor calls get chained up really nicely with this optimization.
Jesus. All right, exception handling. Um, I think we talked a little bit about how um, exception handling is implemented for C++ by calling out the JavaScript, doing a try block, and calling back in. And, and there's a massive rewrite to have to happen because, of course, we have to also rewrite the function body to put what would have been your try block in a separate function that you can call back and do from JavaScript. So it's a pretty non-trivial transformation. Um, and it, it depends on having supporting JavaScript and involves. And so this is the mscripten exception lowering pass that gets handled. Um, if you're not using mscripten, and in JavaScript, then, then basically except handling is just not supported yet. We're, we're basically waiting for Unwind to come along and do that properly. So. Hello. Um, do you think there is any possibility to add like this kind of exception handling in WASI? I mean, it's possible, but like, do you think? Uh, uh, is it reasonable? Um, I think when unwind happens, it'll be the right way. OK, so in general, and, like and for WASI, we'll need to wait until like uh, exceptions are basically like supported on, on the WebAssembly side. Yes. Um, it, it seems like it's going to be a standards process on either side. And, and the, the, the exception handling side is already in progress. And there's already design that's already like implemented in at least one VM. and, and um, in fact, there's also the LVM implementation for that system is already implemented. It's like, although a lot of the pieces are already in place, um, it seems like even if we did a thing in WASI at this point, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make it in time to, to matter. Okay. Because like for, for us, we were looking like to compile some, some uh, modules. And at the end, like, MScripting was the only that like, kind of like handled uh, long jumps and, and set jumps. All right, let's move along. Uh, <laughs> so, MScripting. Um, Lower invoke for exception handling um, at IR passes. So this is basically the end of the, the IR passes for LVM IR. Um, so these are the passes that happen on LVM's mid level IR. Then we have a set of passes that run um, instruction selection. So LVM has multiple IRs as we go through the code process. So it's the main LVM IR, the mid level thing, it goes through an instruction selector IR called selection DAG. Um, and this is mostly generated in, in other files, doing the instruction selection part. And instruction selection is actually pretty straightforward to WebAssembly, because a lot of WebAssembly instructions are one-to-one -one with WASM instructions. Um, argument move. So LVM has a very particular idea about how function arguments should work, because it's assuming it has a machine where function arguments come in, and they're either in certain physical registers or they're in stack slots. In WebAssembly, they come in and they're in locals. And within LVMAR, locals are modified, modeled as, as virtual registers. And LVM wants to think of virtual registers as things that have definitions of instructions that define them. Um, and so we need to have instructions to make LVM happy to think, to think that these are, these are virtual, instruction, virtual registers that have instructions, definition points. Um, but these instructions also need to make sure that we need their, to stay at the top of the basic block. But then LVM doesn't understand that these things need to stay at the top of the basic block, because they don't have side effects. They kind of drift around. Um, selection DAG throws out the linear sequence of instructions and has a, a sea of nodes within a basic block representation. Um, and it doesn't have an understanding of the arguments and the fact that the arguments need to stay at the top of the basic block to represent the fact that they're basically live in in WASM. So we have kind of this mismatch of, of arguments being represented in the same mechanism that local virtual registers are if we translate from like WASM locals, because function arguments are WASM locals, um, if that makes sense. So what we do here is selection DAG may have inserted extra code above the arguments. We need to move the back arguments back up, which is kind of a silly workaround. But at the moment, we don't have anything better to do. Let's make sure the arguments are at the top. So a register locator you know, is aware that the arguments are coming into the top. Um, Create WebAssembly set P2 align operands. Um, alignment is a really interesting topic in WebAssembly if you're into alignments. Um, so in LVM IR and, and following from C and C++, uh, an alignment is something where you make a guarantee to the compiler. You're saying, I know the alignment of this pointer is at least 2, 4, 8, whatever value. Um, 
In WebAssembly, the alignment is just a hint. It's just a sort of semantic declaration of, of um, what you think something should be, but, but it's, it's valid to misalign things. LVM doesn't expect to have alignment hints being presented at the back end. So the instruction selection framework for loads and stores doesn't have a way of propagating the alignment declaration from LVM IR into an alignment hint. Um, and so we actually have to have another pass to go through and collect all the alignment declarations and turn them into alignment hints, because having alignment hints actually can improve performance for WebAssembly code. Um, the reason why we have an alignment hint at all, even though there's no semantic effect, is that if you have something that you know is misaligned, um, implementations can, at least WASM implementations, can preemptively split them into multiple accesses and avoid uh, potentially costly misaligned access that they would have to fix up to preserve the semantics. So, if you do a misaligned access in, in WASM, the semantics will be correct, but you might take a very expensive path in the machine. You might have to trap, you have to go through an OS handler, and it'll, it'll simulate the right semantics, but that's really slow. So we'd like to avoid that. So the WASM hints are hints to the VM saying, by the way, um, split this access up into multiple accesses so that I don't take this very expensive path. I know this thing is, is, is unaligned. Um, and so if you preemptively split it up, it's a little bit slower than it would have been if it was a whole access but it's still faster than if you had taken a trap and gone through the whole path. So we propagate the information from the LVM alignment, what LVM has known, um, and LVM has its own static analysis to try to prove the alignment of various accesses. So it'll actually try to look, and you can take a pointer value, if you mask off the low bits and then do a load, LVM will set the alignment value for that load based on the bits that you've masked off. Um, and then this pass will take the alignment thing that LVM was able to prove and transfer that into an alignment hint for the WASM engine to use. So this is sort of the set of things we do before instruction selection, or before register allocation. Um, after register allocation, all right, so this is more like target configure stuff. So what I'm walking through here is like the configuration of, like LVM has all this target independent code that's doing things, and we have our own function to sort of customize the behavior for our platform. Um, and so we disable a bunch of stuff that LVM would otherwise do. We disable the machine copy propagation and, and post RA machine syncing, post RA scheduling. Um, WebAssembly, from LVM's perspective, has an infinite virtual register file. There's infinite number of locals. And so it's valuable to do coloring because we, we do want to minimize the total number of locals we have, but we don't actually want to spill anything. So we're not going to run the regular reg allocator because LVM's reg allocator has built-in assumptions that it wants to spill, it wants to split and insert copies, and we don't want to do that for WASM. Um, LVM also has a built-in assumption that there will be a lot of things where you're going to have physical register requirements, like calls require their arguments to be in particular registers. Um, and so uh, copy propagation is all about getting rid of copies. We have to copy from one register to another register. Um, in WASM, we don't tend to have these requirements of like, this needs to be in this particular register because we don't have those like physical registers to, be, to have things in. Um, and so we don't do copy propagation and, and we don't do, um, actually machine syncing, that's, a, that's an interesting one. I'm not sure why that's in the list. Uh, code syncing is, is from, like, if there's a statement that's above an if statement, you can push the statement down into one of the branches of the if if it's only used on one side of the if, uh, which can make the other path faster. Um, it's a good optimization to do, although it's possible that we disable it because it also increases code size of the WASM because then we have values that might have been just push pop um, in the original place, so you push it down, now it has to go into a local. You'd have to do a set local and then a get local within the block. Um, it's possible why we do that. Um, we should comment that. All right. Post array scheduling. Um, on, on a lot of CPUs, it's what, okay, go ahead. Maybe I missed it, uh, but what is, uh, what uh, array stands for? Oh, sorry, RA in this context is register allocation. Ah, okay. So all these things, we're so this is the, the post regalic hook. It's a virtual function that yeah. LVM will call the target directory for, okay, after register allocation, what should I do? And so, these are a bunch of passes that LVM would ordinarily run automatically after education. Now we're disabling them. So we're disabling the, the scheduler. Um, 
Scheduling for WebAssembly is, is basically impossible because we have no idea what the actual physical machine is. So we're just going to, and, and scheduling will typically increase code size. It's going it's to split up sequences that would otherwise turn into nice push and pop sequences. It'll, it'll you know, try to minimize latencies and, and or high latencies. And it's like all that kind of stuff is maybe good to do, but it's all going to increase register pressure or it's going to give you less push and pop usage and more get local, set local. Um, and, and you don't know the machine anyway, so it's hard to even know what to do. Funklet layouts. So I mentioned there's the new, um, the support for the new acceptor handling model is already in LVM, and that's what the function layout stuff does. So funklet layout is a thing that was actually invented for the Windows um, SEH, acceptor handling mechanism, where you kind of have this concept of a, a function within a function that gets called. Um, and this is actually something that I myself don't know that much about. I'm not going to try to go into detail because I don't know the details. Um, I just know the high level of, of what's going on. Um, but. There's special support for rewriting uh, the LVM function into functlets um, in order to be able to handle exceptions with the, the, the Windows-style exception handling model, which is similar to the try-catch block that's being proposed for WebAssembly exception handling. So try-catch is distinctly different from the, the dwarf EH model that, that like Linux and other platforms use, um, Mac OS. Um, so we're using the, the sort of Windows model as our base and using functlets as part of that. Stack map liveness. Um, so this is used for um, stack slot coloring. So LVM will tend to allocate um, lots of stack slots for things. And we want to be able to, to reuse stack slots. So we don't have like, lots of different stack slots. We're going to reuse them so we can minimize the total number of stack slots to, to keep our stack footprint down. Um, stack map liveness is. Not that. All right. Whoops. Yeah. I don't need that many. Um. Yes. Well, not All right. So this is one of the one of the fun things about working on a code base like LVM is it's big, and lots of people work on it. Like I don't write all this code, um, like the EH code. Um, Google Google's working on the H code and. Other people have done other parts. So there's parts here that I don't actually know. Um, stack map liveness. So we do do stack slot coloring. The thing I was about to talk about, we do do that. But I think this is something different. Live debug values ID. Um, um, it's the beginning of uh, support for, for debugging in WASM, which is something that a lot of people need. Um, but there's not much there yet. Patchable function ID. Why are we disabling that? I don't know what that is, but it's a good thing we're disabling it. Uh, shrink wrap. OK, so I know what shrink wrapping is. So shrink wrapping in, in native platforms is an optimization where we take the function prolog, or what would otherwise be the function prolog, and instead of running at the top of the function, um, if the function is having some code at the beginning, like maybe it's doing a quick test, and if the test is false, it's going to return. Like, check if my argument is null. And if so, I'm just going to return and not do anything. And so shrink wrapping is, is actually taking the function prolog and pushing it down below those checks. So in the fast path, where you're just going to be like, I checked for null, and it was null, so I'm just going to exit. I don't have to run the function prolog. So I don't have to save all of the, the Kali save registers for the whole function body. If I'm null, only going to have one fast, fast path that does this thing. Um, in WebAssembly, we don't really have function prologs. We never have to save and restore our Kali save registers. That's just not a thing we do, because we have infinite registers. Um, and so we don't, the, so shrink wrapping isn't really a thing that applies because we only have one, one prolog. We do have a stack frame. Um, we have a special way of using it with, with uh, globals and setting up a stack frame. And so it's simpler not to have to deal with, with shrink wrapping for that as well, of modifying the global variable multiple times. And we disable machine block placement ID um, because irreducible control flow. Um, turns out WASM doesn't support irreducible control flow. So any LVM pass which could introduce irreducible control flow, we have to disable it. So it seems like there's a defined trade-off between size and speed. Is that like, and a lot of things going to have to break up if you want to be able to twiddle that? Yes. I mean, it, it's always true that there's, there's a lot of knobs you can fiddle with, um, and, and, and a lot of size speed trade-offs. Uh, We are, WebAssembly in, in the WebAssembly backend tends to be somewhat more biased towards code size than native targets. 
Um, but it's not as aggressive as it, as it could be. Um, there's certainly more that we could do to optimize for code size better. Um, the back end at this point is, is stable, but there's a lot more work that can be done to produce better code, um, as, as has been noticed in a lot of devices. Yes. What's up? Do you have a question? Oh. Uh, I, I, want, I wanted to say that like this isn't just disabled because it affects code size. It's uh, irreducible control flow isn't representable in WebAssembly at all, so it affects both code size and performance. So it's not it's not just like, oh well, in WebAssembly we care about code size, so we're going to disable this. It's just like th this um, yeah, so if massively you, hurts like the output of the WebAssembly. If you do have irreducible control flow, um, so we'll, we'll try as hard as we can in the compiler to not introduce it if you don't have it. But if you do have it, if you write go to and C, and you can create you know, loops that you enter in from multiple places, which is the basic biggest problem. Um, we have a way of implementing it. We have a pass, which I'll get to later, because there's, there's more to come here. There's another pass which will do this. Um, it will essentially create a state machine of a big loop with a switch in it, and we're going to you know, walk through and essentially do the control flow um, as state machine transfers. This works. It is functionally correct. It is also very slow. <laughs> Uh, and so you don't ever want us to do this, even though you might think I'm using GoTo and I'm totally Microsoft optimizing my program with GoTo. Um, you get the exact opposite effect. Your program will go much slower, far slower than any kind of speed up you might have gotten. Um, and so it's just it's, it's e for optimizing for speed. We just need to like anything that could possibly create universal control flow is a thing that could act activate this pass that converts your nice branching into state machine transfers in a big loop. So we really try not to do this. And a sort of uh, sort of related question. You know, this is all talking about uh, compiling the source language to WebAssembly. Mm -hmm. But do you have any experience with compiling the WebAssembly to native? <laughs> in so like as a two-step process, do you have to go through all of this machinery again then? And like uh, how does how does that work? So things like irreducible control flow, we don't have to do it because WebAssembly doesn't have it. So we sort of it's kind of the interesting like uh, inverse effect of things that make. Analysis easier, make transform harder. Things that make transform easier make analysis harder. Um, and so th that applies here, where like, because there's no irreducible control flow, um, we don't need, like in, in, in the crane lift, we don't need to have an algorithm for, for converting control flow into a, a state machine, for example. Uh, because the hardware can do it. In fact, we're actually looking at doing the opposite, in, in potentially, of like, let's, in, in cases where LVM has done this and generated a state machine, can we actually recognize that pattern and you know, undo the transformation and get back to the, the code that you would have written if you had the go to. Um, haven't done it yet. It's kind of this one of these like you know we could if we had to we could go there someday. Because um, there are some cases where like in like muscles malloc or DL malloc, one of the malloc functions has a go to which apparently creates irreducible control flow. Um, and printf because um, people do all kinds of things to make printf fast. They have like a state machine that's doing the parsing of the printf format string. And there's lots of go tos in there because there's lots of cases where printf has like modifiers. And then the modifier jumps to some other case to handle the rest of the string. Um, so I think even in printf, there's some, some, some printf codes have irreducible control flow in them. So it, it comes up. And right now, it just means that our printf is slower than it should be. Um, printf is never fast, but it's slower than it should be. Um, and so we've talked about like, how are we going to fix this? And so there's a lot of possibilities. I mean, there's e even things like funklets. If you look at the functs proposal, it's sort of one approach of like, let's change WebAssembly to just like, have a way to do this. Um, Another is like let's teach the, the WASM engines to recognize the state machine pattern and undo it, um, which is kind of horrible. But um, if we don't have any other options, it might, it might be better than nothing. Um, another possible improvement. So actually, I could, I could also say that the state machine transformation is not optimal. If we were really clever about it and sat down and like really studied this problem, we could probably do a better job, um, because. You don't need to have every control transfer in the state machine. We could have like some of them could still be normal control transfers. Like you have like one big state that has internal control flow in it. Um, we don't do the optimal job using that kind of situation. We end up like inserting uh, more things end up going through the state machine transfers than than need to. So if we were really clever about it and sat down and, and spent a lot of time on this, then we could make it better. Um, it's not something we've prioritized so far. Um, we'll see where that goes. So there's a variety of things we could do here. Um, Adding irreducible control flow to WebAssembly doesn't seem likely to happen anytime soon. And so that's sort of what pushes us to think about other things. All right, pre-emit pass. So this is basically working very close to the end. We're almost going to emit code, although 
almost as relative. We have a lot more to do. So call indirect fix up. In WebAssembly, in a call a directory instruction, because we have a stack machine, the callee argument is the last argument. In LVMAR, the callee argument is the first argument. And this matters when you do stackification, because which argument it is determines which order things in the stack machine need to get, you know, what order the pushes need to happen in. And so we get the LVM call direct and the callee is first, and so we need to rewrite it so the callee goes last, so that when the stackifier runs, which is a later pass, it'll put the pushes for the callee in the right place. Uh, in theory, this makes WebAssembly better because the Kali being last means we have a better opportunity to optimize that. Um, sort of one of the reasons why it was chosen that way. Um, it works better for things like BR table. Uh, the analogy of call and direct is like BR table. In BR table and branch, they can also have arguments, but the, the controlling expression, the thing which determines in a, in a BR if or BR table where you jump to, um, always goes last because the theory is that that'll give the code generator the best chance to optimize it away. Um, so that's why it's last in call and direct. Um, so we have to fix it up, because that's not what LVM expects. Um, then here's everyone's favorite pass, fix irreducible control flow. So irreducible control flow, in a nutshell, basically comes down to loops that you can enter multiple times. So if you have a loop, you can enter it from the top. If you have a go-to somewhere else that can jump into the middle of a loop, that basically is the irreducible control flow pattern. Um, another common case where it comes up is uh, uh, actual state machines or interpreter loops. You, you have essentially uh, each opcode of the interpreter loop, at the end of, the, uh, end of handling that opcode, you kind of want to do, you know, load the next opcode and jump to the next handler, like get it from a jump table, not jump to the next handler. What that essentially creates, if you think about the control flow graph for a big interpreter loop where every block does this, is basically a control flow graph click. And, and click is not a term, a graph theory term we use in compilers very often because we don't really like to think about this. It's like the absolute word case. But it is, by definition, it's your dual control flow because now you have cycles that have multiple entry points. So uh, effectively compiling interpreters to WebAssembly and having efficient interpreters is, is an interesting question. We can do them pretty well today because what usually ends up happening is your interpreter loop will come through as a loop with a switch in it, a BR table in WASM, um, which works pretty well. But we are leaving some performance on the table when it comes to interpreter loops. Um, at one point, we've discussed ideas like, should we have a state machine instruction in WASM, which would take some of the pressure off of the fact that WASM can't do irreducible control flow. Um, and it would allow us to do more optimal things for interpreter loops and state machine kind of use cases. But that's not a thing that exists today. Do various transformations for exception handling. That's a great comment. No. Uh, I'm also, as I said, not very familiar with the exception handling stuff, and I'm not going to dive into this. Um, but this is, this is, I believe, related to the Funklets handling of, of making all the code for a try block go into one place. So I guess one thing I can say is that in LVMAR, there's no concept of a try block, of a distinct region of code, much less a nested sequence of try blocks that are well nested. Um, and so we just have, you know, here's a thing that could call, and here's the thing it could online to, and there's not really a kind of structure. It's just like this arbitrary, like whatever code happens to be there is just, you know, that's just what it is. Um, and so we need to sort of like, and it's kind of ironic because if you're compiling from C++ where you have actual structured try blocks, we throw that away, um, and then we're on the optimizer, and the optimizer could move things around, and, and potentially in ways that could disrupt the structure, so that the, the try structure, things that get moved out of the try box that should be in there, or things from different pl try blocks get mixed together, um, such that you can't just trivially like insert, okay, the try starts here, and the catch starts here. Uh, you actually have to like move code around so that you can have a try block start here and a catch block start here, and the only thing between it is stuff that belongs in that try gut that's going to unwind to that catch. So you have to sort of undo code that the optimizer has moved around in order to form the WebAssembly structured regions. Replace phys regs. So physical registers are like, we call them physical registers. They're the ISA registers. Um, and, and WebAssembly doesn't have any of these, but LVM really likes to think it has a stack pointer because the stack pointer is just so special. And so we sort of tell LVM, OK, fine. You can pretend that you have a physical stack pointer and a physical frame pointer because those are just useful concepts. But at the very end, ultimately, WebAssembly doesn't have these things. We need to rewrite them into something else. So we have to rewrite, OK, any, any reference to the stack pointer if you're doing like an LK, 
or, or a stack slot, whatever it's address, that kind of thing, needs to get rewritten in terms of. Um, in the prolog, we'll actually read from the, there's a global variable which holds the stack pointer value, but then within the main function body, we just have the stack pointer local, so we don't have to do, you know, get, get global and set global all the time. We just have a local we can use. And so we have to rewrite all the things where LVM thought it was a SP, is a magical register, we rewrite it to the local that is now holding the, the stack pointer value. Prepare for live intervals. Okay, so now we're gonna get ready for the, what what we'll do in terms of register allocation. So LVM has an infinite register file. WASM has an infinite register file, if you think about locals as registers. But LVMs is in SSA form, and LVMs doesn't make any attempt to minimize the number of registers. It's thinking, I'm a compiler IR, and I want to have you know, as many distinct registers as I can because that makes it easy for me to reason about. So I'm gonna have SSA form and rename definitions sort of maximally to make it easy for me to analyze things. Um, but in WASM, if we just created one WASM local for every LVM IR value, there'd be a lot of locals, a lot more locals than we already have. We already have a lot of locals, but we'd have a lot more than that. Um, and so we're going to run LVM's regitalcator, or, or parts of it, to do coloring. And coloring just means like identifying locals that are not live at the same time. And live just means the region between when a, a value is assigned to and when that assigned value is read. That's the live range. And so we're going to identify what are those live ranges, and can we find ranges where two locals never are live at the same time, and then we can, we can put them in the same local variable. We can sort of uh, call it coloring, because you can think of, like, uh, it actually goes back to graph coloring, essentially, is what we're doing here. So we're, we're identifying things that don't conflict, that don't have bordering edges in the, in the, in the interference graph. So we run the prepare for live intervals. We're getting ready for, to run LVM's liveness passes. Um, and what this pass actually does would probably take me um, an hour to explain. So if anyone's really curious, we can go, like, I'll be happy to walk through this code after we get done with this talk. But basically, we're trying to, like, so LVM's register locator is set up to allocate registers for a physical machine, which has a finite number of registers, and which will involve spilling and involve copying things to get things to particular registers. And so we're not going to run the actual regstalkator. We're going to run this um, regstackify and then regcoloring is, is, is our own pass. That's going to do a regstalkation-like thing, but it's not going to ever spill. Um, and because it's not the actual regstalkator, um, we don't need the actual thing that LVM's liveness analysis does. We need something slightly different. So I, this is a subtle, complicated thing, and it'd be easier if I could walk through that after this, unless anyone really wants to go through this, but it's kind of like within the guts of the guts here. So I try to adapt to what people want to go into. Um, similarly, there's some optimization we can do to um, combine some live ranges in, in cases where the LVM's educator cares and, and we don't care. Uh, because register coloring is significantly simpler than, than register allocation. Mem intrinsic results. Um, so LVM is a little bit redundant in this case. So we talked about the returned argument attribute in LVM that says that a, an argument to function is returned from its return value. We can optimize with that. Um, but there's also the mem intrinsics, which is things like um, mem copy, mem set, um, which go through LVM as intrinsics that don't have a return value, but we're going to optimize them into libc calls, which do have a return value, and which return their first argument as a return value. But because they went through LVMAR as intrinsics, we don't actually know, we don't have the return attribute. So this is doing the return attribute optimization again. Life as a compiler writer, you get to deal with so much fun things. All right, reg stackify. Okay, this is where things really get interesting. So now we're taking LVMAR, which is just pure SSA form. You know, values are defined and they're live as long as they need to be to get to the last use. And we're going to convert that into a stack machine form. Um, and in the easy case, we can sort of look like where, whenever, when is a value defined in one statement and used in the media next statement? Um, in that case, we can, that, that'll become a push and a pop. Um, this pass actually attempts to be somewhat more clever than that and actually try to move things around. So if you have an instruction that's using a value and it's defined by an instruction that's a couple of instructions up, it'll actually try to see if I can move that down so I can form a push and pop relationship with that. So it'll attempt to do sort of form optimal code sequences. Um, 
there's room for improvement here. Um, stackifying code is actually kind of an art form, and so LVM is only doing a pretty basic job. Uh, it turns out that Binarian actually has done more work in this area. So this is one of the things where if you run Binarian after LVM, Binarian Ops can produce even better code than LVM does. Um, and then we do the actual coloring. And what, what, this, what this sequence means is that we're going to try to stackify registers first, which says essentially get rid of things that would be in locals. So the coloring pass only has to consider things that are actually in locals. So we try to do as much as we can to get rid of as many locals as we can, which is important for reducing code size, but it's also important for getting rid of the things that, that this pass doesn't need to think about because now they're on the stack. All right, so we have coloring done. All right, there's more. More. Please, sir, I want some more. Uh, create WebAssembly CFG sort. So now we're going to get ready for control flow. So we talked about structured control flow a little bit. Um, so irreducible control flow is one problem, and we've solved that by transforming irreducible control flow into state machines. Um, but then there's a general problem of, okay, now I have reducible control flow, but it's still just an arbitrary CFG. It's still just branches. They happen to be structured, but they're just branches. And we need to convert this into WASM's form, which needs blocks and loops and, and, and such things. Um, and so LVM is using uh, an algorithm called the CFG stackify, which operates on an assumption that, well, the basic principle of it is if you ignore loops, if you like, take loops out of the picture for a second, if you look at some straight line code, and if you take LVM uh, of WebAssembly and you say, how many times do I have a forward branch in this code? So it's a forward code. If I do a topological sort of this code, now every branch is branching down somewhere. Um, and I look at every time I'm branching down, I put a label where I'm going to branch to. And then for each label, that's basically the end of a block. So now I put as many blocks as I need at the top to create that many labels. And then I can just end them wherever I need to. So sort of like I can think of it as uh, if, there's, if there's no loops, if there's no cycles, at least, then I can have arbitrary forward branches to wherever I need to go, and I'll just have as many blocks as I need. It's kind of ugly, but that's what it is. I have a question. Uh, how yes. is the block and loop markers are represented in this form? Like, do they have like a separate instruction or? Yeah, so in, in this, in the current code, we actually have instructions. There's an instruction called loop, an instruction called loop end. So what, what are representation we are talking about here? Is it like still uh, LLVM IR, or is it like lower level? Uh, like At this point, we're in a thing which LVM calls machine IR, which machine is IR. yeah, which is similar to LLVM IR. It still has uh, CFG basic blocks this, this, instructions. Uh, uh, WebAssembly flavor, like um, yeah. So the so the instructions, the opcodes of the instructions are WebAssembly opcodes, yeah. but the control flow is still it's in a CFG at this point. Yeah. So is it like uh, this? S to Wasm, uh, like, uh, do, uh, do you remember the thing? Yeah, so we had a thing called S to so Wasm for a while. So it's the same thing, right? Um, or we ah, get read, right? Well, it, it's, so machine IR is, is not quite .s file yet. It's still higher level than .s file. So writing out uh, the actual assembly will come in, in a later step. Um, so here we're in, in, machine IR is just a data structure in LVM. Um, it's, it's essentially a parallel data structure to LVM IR. So there's a function which has basic blocks, they have instructions, and basic blocks have branches that branch between them. Um, and so we're basically going to take this pass and insert instructions, or what, what LVM will think of as instructions, but instructions which represent uh, loop here and end here, and then they'll get encoded. And of course, in, in, in WebAssembly, that turns into a well, loop with an end. Um, this, this kind of dance of trying to tell LVM, because LVM thinks that the only thing that exists in, in a, a function body is instructions. And instructions are sort of these autonomous things that don't have you know, stacking relationships with other instructions. Like, that's not a real thing that LVM knows anything about. So we're kind of trying to model this. So the CFG sort pass internally has this stack concept of, oh, I'm sorry. So CFG sort, so stackify is the one that has the, the, the stack. What the sort pass does is, I mentioned for straight line code, we have to do a topological sort so that all the branches are going forward. Um, so there's no cycles, but we still need to make sure everything's going forward. Otherwise, you could have you know, code that comes down and goes back up and, and down with no cycle. So we do a topological sort first, and then um, within each loop, and then the, the observation for CFG stackify is you do that for the innermost loop, and then you go to the next outer loop, and you ignore the box in the inner loop. And you go to the next outer loop and ignore the box in the inner loop, and you keep doing that, and eventually you've done the whole function. And that would be a way to map arbitrary, reducible control flow into WebAssembly IR. 
Um, we developed this algorithm on the assumption that LVM, or that, that WebAssembly, this was early, early days in WebAssembly before we really knew what WebAssembly's control transfer instructions would be. So this was pretty early on. And um, the assumption at the time was that, well, you know, of course, we'll give ourselves flexible control flow operators in WebAssembly because it's going to be a compiler-friendly language. Um, this assumption was wrong. And so uh, this algorithm is actually not ideal. And so something like um, Scripton's relooper actually might be more effective. And so you actually see this, like if you run binary on your code, it'll make better use of WebAssembly has like the if else operator, which actually is really good at reducing code size in, in, in the, the coding that WebAssembly has. So, so this is a missing feature. Um, we might rewrite this code someday. Okay, can, can I ask the, the, the sorting? It uh, okay, oh, I should yes, have just okay. answered my own question in my head. The sorting is like actually a prerequisite, like it's impossible to stackify without it, or it's just the, it will generate extremely terrible stackification? I think I've answered the question in my own head, but maybe someone else wants to know the answer. This so code actually answer requires anyway. it. So the, the sorting is actually doing the topological sorting. So within a, within a, block, within a loop, um, there are no cycles, but we need to make sure it's in topological order, otherwise like the algorithm can't um, create a block start and end that would end at the right place and have the start happen before the block. Uh, part of that is also that we're trying to, we try to actually do some work to push the block start down as far as we can to have the block start so the blocks are as small. Um, we believe at the time that was worthwhile doing. I'm not actually sure if that matters that much anymore. Um, like, because the, the start, if you don't have any incoming arguments and, and without multi-value, we don't have block arguments yet. Um, the st where, the, where our block actually starts is somewhat arbitrary. Um, the only requirement is that it can't be, you know, before the previous block, wherever that was, and it can't be after the, the first branch that would go to the end. So anywhere in there, and the block could appear anywhere, it doesn't matter. Um, should we try to put it at the top? Should we put it at the bottom? Um, so right now the current code tries to put it at the bottom. Um, but that also is, in order to do that placement, we need to have the box in top order order. So, like uh, earlier, we were talking about how, like, uh, arguments, uh, any any values that are on the stack that are not pushed inside that block are basically read only. Are there any? Um, do you know if there are any engines that that make use of that? And maybe that would mean that the block marker being lower down would be useful. Uh, so, like, 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 so you 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 can't you. Um, yeah, like the, the stack, the stack is basically like frozen when you enter a block, and then like anything you push on top of that is can now be like a, 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 a mutated, basically. We were talking about this. So, yeah, so, the, so the, the, the stackifier thing, register stackifier we talk about actually in LVM does not look across block boundaries at all. So it just, um, and, and in fact, it's incapable of, ha of using block arguments with, with multi-value. It just, it won't be able to do that. Um, I expect we'll have to actually rewrite this pass to handle block arguments effectively. And when we do that, then we'll probably have a different answer to your question. Fair enough. Um, I mean, so block arguments are basically just a way to save code size. And get local and set local are one of the most common instructions in WebAssembly. They happen all the time, and they're kind of big because they have an opcode plus an immediate, and, and compared to push and pop, which are zero bytes essentially. Uh, they it also it means that the liveness of the of the value is is not like the entirety of the function. But I talk about that in my talk, so I'm not going to like. Okay. You don't, yeah. Yeah. Don't, 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 so, don't worry about so yeah. That. So if, on, on the LVM side of it, like our job in many of these things is to, like let's reduce the number of locals we have because that will significantly reduce code size. All right. So I talked about CFG stackify. We're stackifying the um, stackifying the control flow into nested structures. Um, now that we've done all this work, this, the pushes and pops are essentially annotated in the IR. We have blue loop begin and end instructions, block begin and end instructions inserted. Um, now we're actually, so LVM thinks of, like when you use a register and, and define a register, it just thinks this is a virtual register, I can just use it. Um, in WebAssembly, to use a register, you actually have to do an instruction to do get local to use it. And so LVM doesn't model that until the very, very end. And now we're going to go in, in places where we're actually using, um, so this is after stackification is run, so everything that could have been turned into a stack plot is, and now it's just things that are still locals. We need to insert the, get, uh, the local.get and, and local.set instructions for them. Um, so br if, um, and this magical thing called br unless. Um, LVM has some passes that we'd really like to assume that it can take any conditional branch and reverse where it's branching to. And so if you have like br if, and the input of the if is a logical not operation, then LVM would be like, great, I can get rid of that not and just swap the branches. Except that WebAssembly doesn't have a branch on zero, just the branch on not zero. 
Um, in the naming scheme, you could imagine this thing could be called BR unless, and there's actually a proposal at BR unless at one point, and the proposal was not accepted because the belief was that compilers could just do this. And so we actually pretend that we have BR unless all the way to the very end, and now we say, okay, there's still a BR unless at the end at this point. We're gonna re rewrite into a BR if and put the not back in. So kind of ironically, like LVM will be like, I'm optimizing. I'm getting rid of that not for you, and I swap the arms, and then we swap it back and put the not back in and generate LVM, or generate WASM, because that's what WASM wants us to do. Uh, sounds a little bit silly. It's actually not that big of a deal because not is just one one byte of code in Wasm. All right, so we're almost done. Almost made it. We have to do people optimizations. Um, so actually, we can we can dig into this. This is so peephole in, in compilers is a terminology for like let's look at the instruction sequence and sort of look at. Um, you can think of like I have a little peephole and looking at a few instructions at a time and trying to find little things where I can fix things up between instructions. Um, WebAssembly, if you actually look at the binary coding, there's tons of little tricks you can do to reduce code size, like a lot of little tricks. And, and LVM knows some of them. Um, Binarian knows more. Um, but there's, I think we're not done yet, really. The, the space of, because there's so much complexity in terms of like, how you actually order things um, using stack instead of locals, using the control flow operators effectively. There's so many different variants of ways you can order instruct, in expressions. Um, so there's lots of little tricks. WebAssembly people does some of the tricks. Um, and we can dive into this if you want, but I feel like this is already getting kind of long and, and kind of dry, so um, I'll spare you the gory details there. And finally, uh, reg numbering. So LVM has its virtual registers, and they have numbers. Um, WASM has its locals, and they have numbers. And the L LVM's numbers aren't contiguous. They don't start from zero. They start from, well, I mean, they, they do start from zero, but there might be gaps, because the LVM you know, creates lots of registers, and some of them get deleted as, as the optimizer runs, you know, delete some code. We don't use register anymore. LVM doesn't bother renumbering things to make sure the numbers are contiguous. In WASM, the locals are contiguous, so we have to do a renumbering pass. It's the final thing. Once we've done all that, now we have an LVM machine function, which has instructions that have things in it to declare where the control flow structures are. It has things in it to declare what the get locals and set locs are. Um, it has the stack operations are modeled as pushes and pops in the IR, and we're all ready to uh, the final machine code. There's one more IR. There's more. There's MC. Um, I'm not going to walk through that one, because that one doesn't have a lot of interesting stuff. But basically, the MC layer in LVM is essentially LVM's assembler. You can think of uh, like .s files as essentially being the API that the compiler uses. The compiler, doesn't, in, in, in LVM's case, doesn't actually use a separate assembler program. But it has an MC library, which has an API, which is basically the assembler. You have all the assembler directives, instructions, you, can, you would do in a .s file, LVM has an API to do those in an MC. Um, and so we emit the code to the MC layer. Um, that's not in this function. This is because this is, this is just the, the pre-emit pass, and then the emit happens in target independent code of handing it off to LVM. So this is the basic walkthrough at the back end. There's a lot of different pieces here. Um, and I kind of skipped over some of them, but I felt like I also talked a long time. So do people want more detail? Raise your hands for more detail. Woohoo! Oh, we actually have some here. Okay, I was thinking we were like lose people here. Okay, so let's take a look at the peephole pass. I actually don't know uh, off the top of my head um, what we're going to find in here. So let's see. Let me move to a drop register. I'm going to follow through. Let's see. Oh, I know what this is. So we write the follow through. So, so some of this code is, is like three or four years old at this point. So I'm refreshing my memory as I'm looking at it. OK, so we write the follow through. I can tell about this one. Um, so the end of a WebAssembly function, you can return by falling off the end. But really, if there's a return value, um, the, the WebAssembly execution will pop off the return value off the execution stack. And so LVM, like, this is like a high-level language concept that we've sort of imported into WASM. And LVM thinks that there's supposed to be a return instruction, because you have to have something to tell the physical machine to do a return. So LVM needs there to be instruction there. Um, but for WASM, what we really want to do is just stop and say, you know, whatever's on the stack, return that. And so this is a pass, which is actually pretty late, because the, the people pass we saw at the very end is sort of like, OK, now that LVM has stopped looking at this function and doesn't have to, we don't have to satisfy many of its constraints anymore, we can do things like have a return that just falls off the end. And so we, we look for um, end, the end function. We look for, um, 
was the oh, is the virtual register stackified. So it needs to be, so we need to have, the pattern we're looking for is a return, virtual return instruction with, that, that pops its arguments, because then when we delete the return instruction, those arguments will be on the stack and it'll work. So we had to satisfy that the things are stackified in the appropriate way, um, and we do the rewrite. So this is actually like saving a couple of bytes in, in many functions because you can just fall off the end instead of doing a return instruction. So fun up. So this is like this, the, the peephole pass is doing these kind of little things. It's not a really big deal. It's only ever saving you a couple of bytes. It doesn't actually make your code faster because it's the same thing that the WASM engine will do internally. But that's what's happening in, in there. So that helping will do this. Um. Oh, right, okay, so in this, the memcopy, memcove, memset case, um, memsot, memset, memcopy, memove go through LVM um, not as calls, but as well, calls to special intrinsic functions. And the intrinsic functions are sort of friendlier for LVM to reason about, but they don't exactly match the signature of the C library functions. In particular, they don't have the return values. So memcopy, memset, memmove are all defined to return the value of their first argument. Um, in WASM, when you have these kind of situations, um, we have to do a drop instruction to tell the stack machine that we're actually going to drop the value. So it's actually more code size to have these values there. And so um, this actually ties into the, the returned argument of the relation we talked about before. If we did the returned argument thing successfully, um, uh, how does this work here? Maybe we write to drop. This is actually, so if you ever get a chance to like look at code that you wrote three years ago and be like, what was I thinking? Um, I'm getting some of that right now. And also thinking like there's some comments I should write here that aren't as, as well comment as they should be, which sometimes I can't tell until after I come back to code. So look at this, maybe write to fall through. I should put a comment in that function. That would be a good idea. Look at all those arguments. That's a lot of arguments. All right. Oh, this is the one that I know what it does. This is the one that maybe write to drop. Um, Oh, okay, I know what this is doing. So if you have a return value in the LVM, the return value has to be assigned to a register. Values can't just be, they can't just live with other things. So that's to be a register. Um, but in WASM, we're actually gonna put a drop there and then and get rid of the register. So we're gonna insert a drop opcode in WASM. WASM has a drop opcode saying, explicitly discard this thing off the stack, um, which sometimes you need because um, if you leave a block by fall through or if you exit a function by fall through, it requires the exact number of things be on the stack. Is, is, is the signature it declares. So that's what that is. So you're sort of getting like put down on the spot with some old code here, but, but yeah, that's what this is doing. So I guess people optimizations, those are just the two things. So we're fixing up um, adding and drop up code things for the memcopy and mem sets that we added at the very end. Um, and then rewriting the return instruction at the end of the function to be a fall through at the end is the what we call people pass. Yeah, so in terms of like improvements, there's tons of stuff we could do improvements. In fact, uh, is in, in tradition of LLVM, um, all targets have a readme. In fact, um, every target has a readme file. And so we copied that convention. So we have our own readme file of things you could do to make this better. So if you're actually looking for opportunities to make LLVM better, uh, I have a list. Um, and it's here in the source tree. Um, and actually, some of this is out of date because now the .o file format is no longer work in progress. We should update this. All right. Um, I'll, I'll figure that out later. So anyway, we'll get started here. So we can sort of walk through some of these um, opportunities here that start here. So BR, BRF, your table instructions. We're having a value across the jump sometimes. We don't currently use this in the LVM backend. This would return, this would reduce the number of get locals and set locals whenever you can do this because you're, you're, you're passing things on the stack rather than locals. So that would be a good thing to do. Teach the stack how to do it. Um, the min max instructions are floating point instructions um, because floating point is complicated, aren't exactly the same semantics as A is less than B colon A, question A colon B. Um, because NAN and negative zero, um, NAN is a value that always is false. If you say A is less than B and either one of them is NAN, you'll get false. Um, and so this comparison doesn't work right for, for the min in the case of a NAN. Um, 
But it turns out that ARM has the same thing that WebAssembly has in this case. ARM has the same kind of minimax that WebAssembly has. Um, this is not a total accident on WebAssembly's part. We sort of modeled it after ARM and, and Power and others having these in some ways. Um, and also, I should say, actually, since we wrote this, um, this, this kind of min and max that WebAssembly does are actually now in IEEE 754 2018, I think they called it. Um, so it's actually an IEEE operation now. So you've said what the semantics of min and max are not. Um, what is the semantics of min and max when one of the arguments is a NAND? So WebAssembly is min and max, which are IEEE 754 2018 minimum and maximum, is what they're called in this back. Um, if either operand is a NAN, return a NAN. OK. Um, in and, in and this case, uh, if either operand is a NAN, you'll return uh, B, because the comparison will be false. So that's okay. de different than the, the NAN instruction. So you can have interesting arguments about which is better. Um, WebAssembly's and, and IEEE's definition has the nice property of being symmetric, so that you can swap the operands and you'll get the same result, which is uh, a nice property for, like, it's intuitive. Um, it also means if you're doing reductions and you have a lot of things you're putting together, um, you can do that with min and not have to worry about, you know, if there's a NAND that appears somewhere, am I gonna, it's going to disappear when I fold everything together. Right. I, I, I really like the idea that the output of min, min and max propagates a single NAND uh, in either position. I think that's great. Yeah. Uh, presumably, also, um, what I would guess for 0 and minus 0 is the case, which is the max of 0 and minus 0 is 0, and the min is minus 0? Yes, that's actually a thing that I IEEE 754 20, 2008 says is implementation defined what happens with negative 0. Um, in, in the 2018 spec, um, which is, I'm not sure actually if it's even published yet, it's like it, was, it was aimed for 2018, because IEEE 754 rules, or the IEEE rules say they have to publish at least once every 10 years. So they tried to publish that year, but I'm not sure if they got it in in time. Anyway, the, the new spec that was just released, or, or to soon to be released, um, specifies that negative zero is considered less than zero for the purposes of min and max. That's so, really, and that's so WebAssembly true. actually anticipates that. We knew this was coming, so we, we put that yeah. in the WebAssembly semantics as mm. well. Do you happen to know what JavaScript math.min and math.max do? Um, they do the same thing. OK. Good. Thanks. Yeah. So GEP, in this context, is the get element pointer instruction. If you're familiar with LFMAR, you're probably familiar with get element pointer. Although you, it's, it's a, it's a, OK. Oh, yes, OK. Um, get element pointer is basically a pointer arithmetic instruction of take a base pointer, and we're going to add uh, some offsets to it in an interesting way. Um, the offset might be an array offset, in which case you want to scale the index by the element size of the array. It might be a struct offset, in which case you want to you know, add the appropriate struct field. Um, or LLVM's get element pointer is actually sort of an array, and you can do you know, an array that has a struct of arrays of structs of arrays, and, and it'll do all in one instruction, sort of get bundled up together. Um, and so uh, on, on some platforms, they have actually have a pass that will take a big compound get element pointer instruction and split it up into smaller ones. And one of the things that this does is that um, having all these array indices bundled up in one instruction actually hides some of the redundancy from passes like LVMs, um, CSC, and LICM. Um, if, because you can imagine if, if like, you have some array indexing, um, a big you know, multi-dimensional array, and the outer dimensions, the indexing is loop invariant, and the inner dimensions is not, we could potentially hoist the arithmetic for the outer dimensions out of a loop and leave the inner part ENs I. But that requires splitting a get element pointer into two instructions. The, the basic LCM pass doesn't know how to do this. It just looks at the whole get element pointer instruction as one thing and says, this is not loop invariant, because part of it isn't. So other passes have this thing where they can split off part of it and do that. Um, and um, it intuitively seems like that might be nice to do for WebAssembly, because WebAssembly doesn't have complex addressing instructions, at least not yet. There's actually a discussion about this. Um, and so this to-do is like, should we do this? Should we actually do the same thing that ARM does and see if this is better? And I don't know the answer. Someone should investigate someday. Rich stock evasion uses the value stack physical register to impose ordering dependencies. So for LVM instructions that have stack dependencies, and this is for things like alloc A, where you need to have alloc A sequenced with respect to other things that touch the stack pointer. That's a dependency, but it's not naturally represented in LVM, because LVM at the mid-level layer uh, level doesn't have a concept of a stack pointer. Um, 
And, and so part of CoGen also doesn't have a concept of stack pointer yet either. So um, we have this additional physical register we use called value stack, which is sort of like saying that there's stack modifications here, and you have to treat this as a value that might carry dependencies between instructions for the purposes of um, reordering things. So the register stackifier is reordering instructions so how to form more pushes and pops, um, but it can't move an alloc A across a call, for example, because that would potentially change the semantics of the alloc A. Um, alloc A's can, can do bad things if they're too big, and so the call might be protecting it from doing something too big, so we don't want to move an alloc A across a call. So we have value stacks modeling um, stack dependencies, essentially. And so it's pessimistic. This is actually kind of a simplistic solution, and so we should think about maybe there's another way to do this. Um, and off the top of my head, I actually don't know what other way to do this. So who knows? Maybe someone still, still thinks of something. Target transform info. Let's take a look at that file. I can't type today. OK. So things like vectorization in LVM. Vectorization is almost like an instruction selection problem. It's actually getting to a very, very low level. We think of it as like a mid-level thing. So it has to do like mid-level analysis on loops. But the transformation and the, the cost model of vectorization is very close to the cost model of instruction selection, of thinking about like what vector instructions does this machine have, and that'll, that'll guide the decisions I make for how to vectorize a loop. And some of the times, it comes down to how many vector registers do I think I have? How many vector registers does, does LVM have? How many does WebAssembly have? Um, well, it has infinite locals. But if we tell LVM we have infinite locals, LVM will do things like unroll loops um, or, or interchange loops in ways that would assume that you have a large number of vector registers that could hold everything in registers, um, but isn't actually optimal if you don't have that many registers. And so right now, we're just assuming that the target machine has 16 registers, because that's a good number of registers for WebAssembly, maybe. Um, there's the tuning that can be done here, um, both in terms of, like, is 16 actually the best number to pick? We could pick any number here, but you know, what's actually the best? I don't know. Um, but then at the next level up, maybe what we really should do is, is go into LVM's vectorizer and start asking questions there about, OK, if I'm on WebAssembly, and I'm targeting, uh, I don't know what platform it is. It might be ARM, it might be x86, it might be RISC-V, which has a totally different kind of SIMD, potentially. Um, I should think about this in, in WebAssembly terms. Maybe there's different decisions I could make there that are more fine-grained than this kind of generic hook of, you know, tell me how many registers I have. Um, so there's work that we've done there in terms of making better factorization. SIMD is not a thing that we've focused on a lot because it's not in WASM yet. Um, potential optimizations we could do there. Register bit width, that's pretty straightforward. We have 64-bit integers and 120-bit SIMD. Um, get arithmetic instar cost. So these are, these are callbacks. So the LVM has an optimizer. Okay. Um, these are callbacks. The LVM optimizer is doing things like inlining. And when it, when it does inlining, it has a cost model to try to decide, you know, is it worthwhile to inline this function? And this is a notoriously hard problem to solve. Of what's the right heuristics? You can look at like how big do I think things are? Or how much speed up do I think I'm going to get? I mean, LVM will actually look at things like look at the arguments, and if any of the arguments is a constant, and at the call site or at the other side of the, of the, the call e, if those arguments are then getting fed into things like additional branches, LVM will give those an extra boost in terms of the cost model because it assumes then that a constant that can get fed into a conditional branch after inlining will then cause the conditional branch to get folded away, which will cause more code to get folded away. So LVM is sort of like predicting the future of optimization when it inlines. And, and, by do, and when it does that, it also has to consider, like, how much am I saving? What's, what's the value of this? And so it has to have this cost model of, you know, how much does an instruction cost? That's a very hard question to answer in WebAssembly because it's a portable model. It's going to be different on every target platform. We can kind of make some generalizations. We can kind of assume that, like, integer division is going to be slow everywhere just because it's division and no one likes to do division because um, it's slow. And add is fast. We don't really have a lot of modeling here. You could imagine we could do a better job than, than what's currently being done. And this could potentially make inlining somewhat more optimal. Um, inlining is hard to really predict.
All right. OK, is this thing working? There we go. Vector instruction cost, same deal. Um, 25. Is that too high? What do people think? Do you think 25 is a good number? Higher, lower? Uh, how expensive is a vector instruction? Uh, so this is stuff where like, this is like you could, this is tuning. Like there's work to be done to like go there and tune things, in particular for SIMD generation, but but also for other stuff in it too. Um, 25 abstract units of performance. Um, and it's relative, because LVM actually doesn't, in the optimizer, doesn't really care about absolute like, cycles or, or time units even. It just wants to know like, how much am I saving to do this versus doing this. And so it's all relative. So there's like this, so 25 compared to other instructions. Actually, so, so specifically, if I look at this comment and see what's going on here. So this is looking at the cost of uh, uh, SIMD insert and extract, uh, like insert an element into a SIMD register or extract element. Um, and in the case where this index, index equals negative one, um, indicates that we're going to do a dynamic index, of like dynamically index into a SIMD value. That's not a thing that, that many SIMD machines actually have the native instructions. So actually, that's the case where so 25 is actually a pretty big number. So we're saying that that's pretty expensive to do. Of What we'll end up doing is we'll end up storing a SIMD value on the stack and then dynamically indexing into the stack is how we'll end up lowering that. Because actually, I think. Last time I looked, I think Wasm SIMD doesn't actually have an insert and extract that can take a dynamic index at all. Um, so we're, we're going to tell LVM's vectorizer that if you're vectorizing a loop that would have this pattern and it needs this kind of extractor insert in it, um, maybe don't do that because that's actually pretty expensive to do. Um, but, but this is actually ultimately a pretty arbitrary number, and there's more work to be done to, to tune this stuff to be optimal. So as we go through all this stuff, kind of one of the big lessons is that this is a pretty big complex machine. and there are a lot of opportunities for tuning. Um, we've done some work, um, but right now, honestly, like my focus in WebAssembly is putting together the bigger picture, and not trying to squeeze out the last you know percentage points on every single benchmark. Um, and so, like the, the LVM Watson backend is at a point where it works pretty well. The, the correctness is pretty well established at this point. You know, a lot of people have been fuzzing it, a lot of people have been testing it. Um, but there's certainly a lot more that could be done to make it generate better quality code, smaller code, faster code. A lot that could be done. Um, a related thing that's actually not in this file, it's going to be somewhere else, but a related thing is the, the pass that looks at induction variables. So if you have an induction variable, you have, maybe I'll actually do an example. Okay. One last thing here. So bog standard C for loop here. And then we have some array. Uh, this is kind of actually one of the classic questions in, in compiler backends. It's like, what's the best way to cogen this on a, on a machine? And so we have a few different options. Um, if A is a thing that's in a register, the base address of the array is a thing that's in a register, one option is just to keep that in, in one register and have a separate index register and do you know, A plus B of reiteration. And on some platforms, that A plus B is a thing that the, the hardware can do directly. Like the, the load instruction, or the store in this case, um, can take two registers and do the add right there as part of the store. WebAssembly doesn't have that kind of store. It just has a store instruction that takes one input, just the register. Um, and so LVM has optimizations to do this, and they're parameterized on, you know, tell me what instructions the machine has and how many registers they can take. Um, in fact, like x86, you can take two registers plus a constant, um, and, and one of the registers can be scaled by one, two, four, or eight. So it's kind of like, I can, like in a store instruction, I can do a two adds and a shift plus a store all in one instruction because CISC is great. Um, and so LVM has a pass that whenever you have a loop like this, it can actually look at this loop and try to figure out how can I map this induction variable into a thing that can be mapped into an address mode on the platform. Um, WebAssembly doesn't have this stuff, and so there's actually work to be done to teach that pass in LVM about WebAssembly so that it doesn't do suboptimal um, induction variable handling. To basically say, like, no, don't try to do anything clever here because WASM doesn't support it. So another um, optimization opportunity there.
Yeah, so this is actually, we talked about the return attribute at multiple different points in this talk. Um, it's actually kind of awkward that we handle it at a bunch of different points. It would be better if you sort of cleaned that up. It would be better if we had a better way to do that. Um, but I don't know what that is. So LVM has a bunch of hooks for optimizing um, select, compare instruction, conditional branch, optimize load. These are basically a bunch of really low-level pattern matching optimizations of handling special case things. And optimize select essentially says it's a generic optimization, but it needs some hooks from the target to tell it about how the select instruction works. Um, and so there's these hooks, and they're not, they're not implemented for Wasm right now. So we can implement these things and enable these optimizations. So there's more optimizations we could turn on if we implemented these things. And these are probably pretty simple to do, because like, we just need to tell Wasm that LVM, or tell LVM that Wasm has a select instruction, tell Wasm that has a, tell LVM that there's a compare instruction, conditional branch instruction, that kind of stuff. So the shrink wrapping pass, I talked about the shrink wrapping is moving the prolog of function down into the function inside the function. Um, we don't typically want to do that because it creates problems with the LVM stack pointer global. Um, but maybe we could fix those problems. And then we can actually turn on the shrink wrapping pass, which would be kind of fun. Shrink wrapping pass is kind of nice because it gives you some of the benefits of inlining without actually having to duplicate the code. Because if you have a fast path, uh, inlining often allows you to have that fast path get inlined. And so you only take the, the fast path and, and avoid the call overhead on the fast path. But if you do shrink wrapping, then you can avoid the call overhead of the, the prolog and epilog without inlining. So it'd be kind of cool if we could fix it and actually enable shrink wrapping. Um, setting locals. Yeah, this is actually an interesting question. Of if I have to have the same constant value in multiple locals for whatever reason, what's the best way to do that? Should I just multiply through two consts? Or should I use a T instruction? Um, what's the right way? Uh, ultimately, in WebAssembly engines, it doesn't actually matter that much because most WebAssembly engines can just you know, tear through all this stuff and, and get down to the same thing in any, in any case. Um, but there's interesting questions to be asked in terms of code size, of like, what's actually the best code size? And it can depend on how many times this local appears. Um, there's more investigation to be done there to figure out what's the actual optimal thing to do. I mentioned there's a lot of ways to make WebAssembly smaller. There's lots of little tricks like this where we can do like, little sneaky things to make things a little bit smaller in ways that really don't affect performance in any meaningful way, but do affect code size. Uh, actually, they, so I should say, performance could get affected in, in like, single pass JITs, like Lightbeam, um, or, or the, the baseline liftoff kind of things. But um, in, in optimizing JITs, this stuff will just get eliminated. So. Oh, it does? Oh, it's it's fault on light beam. Okay. Sorry? What did you say? Same performance on light beam. Oh, same performance on light beam. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I I messaged you. So, so same performance on light beam. So light beam is actually somewhat clever about about using registers and actually see this as well apparently. So this stuff is it's mostly. Oh, the, sorry. Oh, sorry, I thought you meant the the I think you call slow with the T. Is that which one? I'm talking about this pattern up here. This one. If we do this. Yeah, that that, that one's the same. Okay. Um, Great. Yeah, so actually, there's a third you, option here. Besides, I think, I think you're right that um, it uh, will emit explicit zeroing. Uh, okay. or, no, it will not. It will not. Never mind. No, yeah. No, both, both of those are the same performance. So there's actually a third option here, which I didn't list here. Is like, do you hit the, or another option to say, I threw that const zero once, and then um, every time you need to use it, redo the I threw that const and just put that everywhere immediately before the use. Um, yeah, so, so again, JITs can, if they want to do this, they can do this for themselves. So we could just look at the code size applications. And sometimes that's actually smaller because you're avoiding get local, set local traffic, which take up size. So you can play all these games of like, you know, it's smaller in some cases, and, and figuring out those cases can be complicated, and they only save a couple of bytes. But if you do all the tricks, you can save a lot of code bytes. But there are a lot of tricks to do. Um, WebAssembly registers. Uh, at the beginning of a function, uh, local values are all set to zero implicitly, and LVM doesn't know that. LVM thinks that registers come in holding garbage values, so LVM will explicitly set things to zero at the beginning of a function, which is totally useless in WASM. Um, we should get rid of that. So WASM uses the LEB128 encoding for a lot of things. Basically, any time there's a constant in, in WASM, it's encoded as LEB128. And that means that small values can be as small as a byte, and big values can be multiple bytes. 
So you have things like local, get local and set local. If you have a lot of locals, like more than 256 or more than 127 locals, um, you'll start getting multi-byte locals. And what we really want to do then is find the locals that are used the most and put them in the first 127 registers. And then the ones that are used after that, then the 2-byte the LB128s and the 3-byte ones. Um, we don't currently do that sorting. So we know it's kind of like a random uh, numbering assignment. So we can be better there and use smaller code size again. Um, I think I mentioned this one. We could do a better job with, with irreducible control flow. We do a thing that works right now. There's room for improvement. Regstackify. So Regstackify, as I mentioned, it's in the business of, of reordering instructions to better form pushes and pops. Um, right now, it will never move a load across the store. It just doesn't make the alias analysis query to determine if that's safe. If it did that, that would give it more opportunities to forward loads and stores. Um, I think I'm running really low on time here, so um, that's the, the, let's see. A lot of stuff in this file. Oh, we're almost at the end here. Well, maybe not. So there's a bunch more. So there's Regstackify is a greedy algorithm. Non-greedy algorithms could exist. They could do a better job. Uh, if we actually did run a scheduler, um, LVM schedulers have parameters to tune them for different things. We could actually tune a scheduler to schedule for optimal stackification, which is something they do currently. But you could imagine like, maybe try to schedule such that whenever there's a def, if it can be followed by a use immediately, do it. Um, or try to tune the scheduler to be aware of, of FIFO properties of pushing and popping things. Um, is a thing that could be done and would improve stackification, um, which would mean less locals, which would mean smaller cosize. OK, so a long time ago in WASM, uh, when it started off, it came from WASM.js, this property of being an AST. So WASM was an AST, which meant that all the instructions sort of formed a, instead of being pushes and pops, you could sort of think it's just an encoding of an AST. Um, and during the design process, WASM was converted from an AST into a stack machine. And one of the things that this means is that you can push things. And then between pushing things and popping things, there could be additional instructions that don't do anything. And you could pop things. This really couldn't appear in the AST because there's nowhere in the AST tree where like, something in the middle could happen that doesn't participate in the tree anyway. So the stack machine is more general. It like, gives you more opportunities to push and pop things and save more code size because there are fewer locals. That's the repeating story here. Um, but that, that property is actually not modeled in LVM. A lot of the reg stackify algorithm was developed before WASM was a stack machine. So it's still thinking that it can't do this if we added that property. We could do smaller code size. Um, Mergeable sections. So if you have the same string, if you want to say hello world multiple times, um, compilers will uh, coalesce the strings. And we don't do as much of this as we could for WebAssembly. Um, so there's more stuff. Um, this is the file here in, in WebAssembly. You can check it out. And I'm out of time. So thanks for listening. This is kind of a random talk, but hopefully this was helpful.